In this video, I'm gonna be going over my entire lens and camera collection, everything I've accumulated over the last eight years and everything I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Check it out. Let's uh, go over first everything that's here um, and start from there. So we have my first pro body right here, the Nikon D4. I bought this in 2012, 2013, 2012, 2012 probably. Um, so I literally, in the thought of spending almost six grand on a, it was probably six grand on a camera, uh, I literally said to myself, because I had two big jobs coming up that weekend, I said, if I don't have this and I'm going to make enough money at these jobs to just buy it, why wouldn't I just buy it now and then when I do the job, the job is going to come out better. And I basically used that philosophy with buying all the other gear I've had. If it makes sense that that, that piece of gear is going to make me money, then I'll buy it. If I'm buying it simply out of ego because I think it's cool or it'll be neat, and I don't really know what the return's gonna be on it, I really very, very, very rarely will splurge and do something like that. But so, back to the Nikon D4. This is still such a tried and true camera. It's awesome. I have over 350,000 shutter clicks on it. It's never failed me. It's never been broken. I've never had a problem with it. Um, even now, you know, you can still crank away at ISO 10,000 and it's going to hold its own just fine. Like you can find used deals on these guys for around, you know, less than two grand on Amazon. And I would say that this is still an amazingly good buy if you're looking for a pro body. Don't really use it anymore, but I still am holding on to it. It just hurts my soul to try to think about selling this for 1500 bucks when I bought it for over six grand. Uh, amazing camera. Great place to start. All right, let's move on. The current pro body I'm working with, Nikon D5. Um, it's the best camera for sports that exists. What did I say, sports or sports? Sports. The best camera for sports that exists. There is simply nothing better at high ISO than this. Uh, the focus systems are really dialed in where those were a bit of a downside on the D4. Um, it just does everything. The buffer never fills up. It's built like a tank. Never had problems with it. Uh, it's just a, it's the best sports camera there is. There just isn't a better one. Um, yeah, uh, the version I have runs two XQD cards. They're the fastest memory cards. Might as well put them on the fastest camera. They're obnoxiously overpriced, but they are what they are. And when I'm doing an event, I'm able to get my pictures off of the camera much faster than everyone else can, which means I can edit them faster, which means I can upload them faster, which means I'm done much faster. So. Nikon Z5, not going anywhere anytime soon. All right. This is the latest and greatest, Nikon Z6. Every single person that's asked me, what camera should I buy? I'm looking at a D5, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at that, what camera should I buy? This is always the camera I tell them. Not completely true, but for the most part true. This is the camera that's kind of won me over on the idea of mirrorless cameras coming into like sports photography and just really making a strong move in replacing, uh, in replacing uh, DSLRs in place of mirrored cameras. And this thing is just a monster. Its focus systems are incredible. It's like one of the big downsides to these DSLRs is its focus grouping is gonna be much, much tighter. So no matter how much you move that focus point over to the left or to the right, you're gonna hit a wall. And it's usually like, let me see if I look at my monitor. So it's gonna be like that, okay? Oop, that way, yeah. Um, with this, you're going all the way edge, 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 edge. So you can grab focus points that much easier. And then the auto tracking systems they have are just awesome. And then when I hold up ISO 10,000 on this camera, ISO 10,000 on the D5, I am just shocked about how similar they look. Um, so it really can hold its own. Um, if I don't have to, I really try not to reach for the D5 and I'll use this more often. Uh, and then the other thing is getting used to that eye, um, the eye viewfinder, electronic viewfinder. Uh, looking through that and actually getting a decent representation of what your image is actually gonna look like when you take it 
really does help avoid a lot of common mistakes you're going to make with the DSLR, no matter how good you are about keeping an eye on your monitor, or keeping an eye on your meter, you're able to, in the moment, know, is my shot too bright or too dark? Just that fast, without glancing at anything else. So if situation changes very quickly on you, you're just looking live through that, and you're able to change it super quick. So love this camera, love where it's going. I would love if it was tougher, more like the D5, but, Whatever, it's Nikon's first crack into it. It's great, cool. Uh, obviously then, the adapter. What was great, and one of the reasons that I bought this when I did, is Nikon basically did a giveaway, or a $200 off, or whatever it was, that made the adapter free. So now, all of a sudden, I'm able to adapt all of these lenses that I already had, that I already bought, onto this, and I see no downside to that. I I've not used any of the native glass on this, simply because with a collection of lenses like this, I am not going to replace a 70 to 200 that I have for my DSLR with a 70 to 200 that then only works on this system. You know, I wanna have stuff, if I am gonna buy any lenses specifically for this, it would be something that I don't have behind me because I'm not just gonna waste money just to have two of the same lens. Um, but yeah, the adapter, I've gotten questions before, does the adapter work? Yeah, there's no competition, there's no other adapter. This is the adapter you have to buy. It works, it does its job. Um, and they actually put a, a mounting point on the adapter itself, which is actually kind of nice. So you can put your black rapid thing in there. Uh, I'm not gonna talk at all about video on this. Hint, it's pretty, it's, it's really good. But this is all gonna be photo, so we'll do that on a different video. <clears throat> all right, now. Maybe what you came for, the lenses that I got. Let's just name them off real quick. We'll start over here in kind of what the, uh, the, the core system here and then move over to some of the fluffier pieces that I don't really use as much. So I would say I'll start with this guy, Nikon, no, that's a lie. No, I'll start with this guy, Tamron, 24 to 70, version two, yeah, G2. All right, uh, let's go. Nikon, 14 to 24, 2.8. Nikon, 70 to 200. This is the version two. Never bought the version three. Kid you not, one of my favorites, Sigma 15 Fisheye, 2.8. An absolute must have, Sigma 3514, one of their art series lenses, love it. The big guy hiding back here. The Sigma 120 to 300 2.8. This one is gonna get a whole video on it because this is a very, very unique piece of glass. All right, let's see what else we got here. So that would be, to me, kind of my core system. The, this zone here. Uh, then some other stuff. This is a Nikon 24 to 120. F4. This lens is pretty shitty. It's not very good, um, but it does its job. And its job is to be a one lens to rule them all, that you're traveling, you're throwing something in a bag. I don't know if I've ever used this to take a single professional photo ever. Uh, I've used this for plenty of travel stuff or like, you know, I'm out on the town and I just wanted to have a camera with me and something that was very variable. So especially if I was like on a snowboarding trip with friends or something, this is a good one to have with you because you can still get a 120 and you're gonna be outside and it's gonna be bright, but it just isn't that fantastic of a lens. I've used it a ton for video back in the day, especially when I did all my video on Nikon, and it did a great job. Cool. Um, yeah, I would sell this in a heartbeat. I just don't think there's much of a market for it. Um, okay, what else do we got here? 50, 1.4, also by Sigma. Beautiful lens. What we got here? 85, 1.8. You may wonder why I don't have the 1.4. I'll tell you later. And last but not least, the 60, Nikon 60 millimeter macro. Cool. Okay, let's start this off with the Tamron 24 to 70, 2.8. My favorite workhorse lens. This lens is always the first thing I'm gonna pack with me on every job I do. It has the most versatile use possible. It can do everything. 
Uh, and it's and one of the biggest things for me in my lens buying and lens using philosophy is it's not overpriced. It's like a perfect price so that you don't feel like you're carrying this like super fragile piece of glass that you won't use ever. It if you break it, you could just buy it again and you're still cheaper than the Nikon 24 to 70. Uh, so why did I buy this one instead of some of the other ones? Uh, first reason is back in 2012, I bought my first 24 to 70 and I looked at the comparison between different brands, but I simply couldn't afford the Nikon lens. Uh, so I bought the Tamron 24 to 70 that was out at the time. I guess that was the version one and it was awesome. And I put 200,000 clicks through that lens and it broke three times on me all because of things I did to it or crashed it into things or had weights dropped on it. And every single time I took it to Tamron and they completely rebuilt it and fixed it for me for free. So they kind of had a customer for life. And then when I saw the reviews that came out on this version two, I knew it was time. And I uh, sold my older one uh, when I just was ready to make the switch when I thought its value was as high as possible. And now I've been using this one for at least the last year. And uh, it's awesome. It just does the job. I'll throw some pictures up showing the original raw file and then also with a little lens correction on there. Anytime you're dealing with the 24 to 70, um, you're always going to have a little more of that bowing on the edges, especially at 24. Uh, but lens correction fixes everything. You're never going to notice any issues with it. Uh, if I had any one particular issue with this lens, it is these two switches right here. Uh, when I'm using this, if I'm using two cameras at the same time, this one is probably going to be at my hip most of the time. And these two switches will flick so easily as they're rubbing against me. Uh, and they're important. One of them is the AF MF button. And then the other one is the vibration control button. And all the time I'll look down and have to click these back on before I start shooting. And that has the potential of missing a photo. So that I don't like. Yes, I know I could put tape on them. I just haven't, and I just, it would really hurt me to tape up the side of the lens. That would be gross. Um, what else about this guy? Uh, amazing, amazing video lens because it's got that VC built in, but I keep cheating. I'm not gonna talk about video here. Uh, if there was one lens, someone starting out, who was ready to like, okay, I know I'm gonna do this for a while and I wanna start investing money, I'd get that 24 to 72 weight before I did anything else. Um, and that's really gonna start getting you moving in the right direction. Anytime you're indoors, this is probably going to be a good starting point lens for you. Uh, cool. Tamron 24 to 70 G2. Nikon 70 to 200 2.8 version two. This is the second 70 to 200 I've ever purchased. I've had this guy since at least, probably, let's say 2013. Um, I bought this pretty soon after I bought my D4. I originally got the Sigma 70 to 200 that was out at the time, which is probably unbelievably outdated. And it was a good workhorse lens. It was, I bought it used, I bought it cheap, and I needed a 70 to 200. At a certain point, there's just things that this lens can do that no other lens can do. It is a very special focal length, especially if you're doing sports of really any size. Um, so eventually when I had a couple more bucks and I knew that, that we're definitely going to be shooting a lot, I wanted to make sure the images that we're taking looked as good as possible. And to me, I've used the Sigma and Tamron versions, but this Nikon still, it's the best. It, 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 at the time I bought it, was dramatically better than the 70 to 200s that its rivals made. Uh, that might not be true right now, but this guy also works perfectly, so I have no reason to change it. Um, you don't just have to keep chasing whatever the newest version of a lens is. Uh, when it worked in 2014, it still works really, really well in 2019 right now. Uh, this lens has a lot of magic to it. Um, where I would use this even if I was just still pretty much shooting to its shorter end. If I was still shooting between that 70 to 85 millimeter range, maybe I'm inside or something, uh, I would still rather pick this up every single time than a 24 to 70 
because of the compression you're going to get with that 70 to 200 where you stack up all that glass and then take the shot to me it creates that look that i'm always wanting where it makes stuff look a lot more special and when now your biggest competition is literally iphone photography in some cases and they can do so much with smartphones now that nothing will ever replace just putting this much glass in front of your sensor. Um, so you can get some real magical stuff. Um, who is this lens for? Anyone doing small to mid-sized field sports has to have this. It's just not a choice. You can't be like, oh, I'm gonna use a 24 to 120 or use a variable aperture lens or anything like that. You just have to have this. 24 to, 24 to 70 first, 70 to 200 second. This Nikon is great. Uh, I know the 70 to 200 version three is better, but you could also pay a mortgage for a month or two with the cost of that lens. I don't know if it's necessarily worth it. And uh, I really do want to look into the new Sigma and Tamron versions of this, because again, I'd rather go for something that's almost a thousand dollars cheaper uh, and only maybe three or 4% worse. Uh, and when you're talking about bad with these lenses, for the most part, once you're over that thousand dollar point, there is no real bad lens anymore. They're good. It just becomes these like very, very small margins. Um, in use, I've had more work done on this lens than any other lens that I've owned. Uh, and it's caused me problems. I've had the connections down here go out. I've had the VR go out. I've had the focus go out. Um, and I've had to have it fixed a number of times for those reasons. Uh, Nikon is a pain to have them fix your stuff. Uh, I live on Long Island and I'm able to physically take the lens to them to cut off all that shipping time. And I still have had a lot of issues with getting stuff fixed the first time and getting it fixed properly. And none more so than with this, with this lens. Um, I think they've actually replaced a number of elements in it and you have even switched the serial number. They've done so much work on this lens. Uh, lately, it's working great, so I have nothing to complain about. Um, in terms of its ruggedness, it is weather sealed. I've gotten rain and sand all over it and never had a problem, other than maybe I had to take it to the shop a number of times to get stuff fixed. Uh, but it's a gigantic piece of glass. It's like holding a telescope. and. Uh, it keeps working and it's been working now and I have absolutely no interest in swapping it out. Um, yeah, cool. Nikon 70-200 version two. Cool. Okay, next on the line, when you start talking about essential lenses you should have in your bag, uh, for me, my number three that I would have, or maybe not necessarily in that order, it might depend on budget, it's gonna be this 3514 from Sigma. It is one of the best lenses I've ever bought. I have probably taken all of my favorite vacation photos, all of my favorite walk around photos have been taken with this prime lens. I love the look of a 35, and I also really like the look of a 35 if I'm doing any type of sport where I'm able to actually get close to people. Because with this, I can get head to toe if I'm out here, get a little closer, I'm now isolating stuff. The focus system in this is incredibly fast and it was able to just lock on to stuff very, very quickly with whatever camera body I've put it on. And it's, uh, it's great. It's also super durable. You probably can't see too well. I'm gonna do one. Okay, there you go. You probably can't see too well, but maybe you can. All of the scuffs and scratches and cracks, not even cracks, but just all of the surface air wear and tear that this thing has, and it has never given me a problem once. Um, shooting advice with this, I would always keep it around 1.8 uh, because most photographers just don't realize at 1.4, shooting with a lens like this in any kind of action environment, it is gonna be so hard to keep that focus point actually on the eye and not drifting a little forward or a little back. Whereas you go to 1.8, the image is gonna be that much sharper and you're really gonna be able to nail that focus every time. Um, if I was a budget strapped person and I was like, oh, I want to be a sports photographer right now and I want the kit that's going to kind of jump me ahead, the first two things I would buy, depending on my sport, are probably going to be this 35-1.4 and the 70-200. to And I'd be able to replace that 24-70 to entirely with this. Um, yes, it's a prime lens, so you got to move around a little more, 
but you're also, again, talking about saving hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, and then only needing two lenses. Uh, for a long time, I basically just gave up on using a 24 to 70 just because I got bored of it, and I only used this as my, my wide range lens, and it, it was great. And I just love that look that a prime lens is gonna give you. Um, so yeah, absolute favorite, Sigma. Great lens. Okay, let's talk. Sigma, 15 millimeter, 2.8 fisheye. This is one of the most unique lenses that I will always have with me. First of all, it's very, very small. So you can pack this into any bag. Um, I've had this thing forever and I also bought it used. So it was years older than I had it then. Um, some of my, to me, most <clears throat> interesting and high impact shots I've taken have actually been with this lens because a fisheye used properly can really create some very weird, interesting shots that draw people in. I'll try to like do a couple of those, pop them up. Uh, the big downside of this lens is it does not have an internal focus motor. You have to have a camera that has a focus motor if you want its autofocus to work. Example, the Z6 does not have an internal autofocus motor. But the flip side of that, with a fisheye, you're generally taking a wider shot and you can manually focus it very, very, very easily. Because with a fisheye and a 15 millimeter like this, almost everything is in focus at infinity. So you can usually hand crank it pretty easily, but it's an important thing to know. Now, when I bought this, I looked at the competition at the time and there really was not a lot in the fisheye market at the time. I know Sigma has, um, no Canon has something and I know Nikon has rolled out something new, but at the time it was one of the oldest lenses they had that they had never gotten around to updating. Uh, this thing is one of those that like, I'll put a picture up and people will go like, how did you take that picture? And it, the answer is always this guy. You can deliver really, really, really unique perspectives, but the magic in this lens is using it sparingly. Like this is not a workhorse lens that you're just taking thousands and thousands of shots on. You're getting one or two unique shots, maybe establishing shots or maybe some really unique perspectives. Um, but it's absolutely indispensable to me. Sigma 15 millimeter, it's old, it's awesome, it gets the job done, uh, and it has been through hell. Like, look at this, this is the old Sigma branding on here, um, and you can see just all the paint is peeling off, but looks pretty sweet though. It's awesome, super, love this thing. All right, let's talk about the big boy here. Sigma 120 to 300 2.8. In 2014, I think is when this lens was announced. And within a couple weeks, I had ordered my own. This was the most, at the time, other than my pro body, this was the most expensive thing I had ever bought. I think it was around $3,000. And the, the question when you start getting into like a, I guess this would be called a super telephoto. Uh, but when you start talking about the big boy lenses, like this guy, a Nikon 200 to 400, and then some of the like crazier other ones is, is it worth it for me to actually buy this or does it make more sense to rent it? Um, and for me, the answer has been buy because I've used this as a replacement for a 70 to 200 in a lot of places where most people were just using 70 to 200s. Like the joke with this lens to me has always been that when everyone else stopped at 200, I could go to 11. I could turn it up to 300 and get that extra punch. And just like I talked about with the 70 to 200, there's so much glass in here that the compression it gives you and the ability to isolate subjects at distances and also close by, and then just turn that background into mush is just, it's just awesome. It's really great. Um, the, o, the Sigma calls it OS in here is very good to the point where I generally shoot this handheld without the use of a monopod, simply so I can get some better angles and also move around a lot faster. Um, I've had this since again, 2014. Uh, I, lost the, I lost the connection point at one point and Sigma fixed it up free of charge. Sigma also amazing job in the customer service department. Um, and one of the big pluses of this, just like the 70 to 200, is it's internally zooming or internally magnifying, whatever it's called. Um, so that way, especially if I'm set up, I'm not 
going in and out. And if I'm on a field or I'm out on the beach or something, I'm not getting sand driven into it over and over and over. It's all sealed up. I've had this thing rained on, sanded on, snowed on, um, and it's done great. Uh, I've also, I started this by talking about uh, maybe it makes more sense to rent it. One of the interesting things about this lens is it is so popular and there's so f seemingly so few of them. A lot of guys I know have tried to rent it for events and have been unable to, whereas I've always literally just been able to have this. So if again, the rental is going to cost me 300 bucks for a weekend, I've used this way more than 10 times in the last almost six years. Um, and been able to use it whenever I want, as freely as I want. So I really think I've been able to deliver a lot of unique pictures using this guy right here. Very cool lens. Also super duper heavy. Gets a couple good curls in here. Cool. Okay, next up here. This is one of, to me, my most controversial lenses. Uh, Nikon 14-24 2.8. Um, at the time I bought it, it was one of like one of the most revered lenses ever. Everyone talked about how great it was. Uh, Jared Poland was a big proponent of why this is like kind of one of the core pieces of what he would call like the Nikon Trinity. Um, I'm not crazy about this lens. It does, uh, it does its thing very well, but I think you have to be very, very careful using it. Like if you're going to do architecture stuff, landscapes, of course, this is a good lens, but bringing this into sports is a, is a unique case by case basis. Taking pictures of people with a lens this wide can create some really weird distortions that are not flattering to anyone. Um, and generally for me, what I've found way more effective is the fisheye because there I'm knowingly putting distortion in and knowing where I'm going to put it. Whereas this is this weird kind of range, this ultra wide lens. Um, and it also doesn't have any stabilization in it too. Uh, which I just think lenses should just have that nowadays. Um, talking about wear and tear, it sticks a little bit when I turn it. It's never created any problems for me, but there's definitely something going on with the barrel on this guy. Um, and I really have not used it very much. Uh, if anyone wants to buy it, I'd sell it to them. Uh, I just don't see for sports getting enough use out of this to really make it practical for most people. Um, Whereas I would just use a fisheye and say pocket the other $1,800 or whatever it is. Um, it's cool. It looks neat. But again, taking pictures of people with this lens, it's going to create some really weird distortions. And you got to use it just right. Then again, you use it right. You can get stuff no one else is getting because people are leaning so hard into that 24 to 200 range. Whereas if you show up and then shooting at 14 millimeters, you're gonna get some cool stuff, or at least different stuff, which is, to me, sometimes the exact same thing. Cool. 14 to 24. Okay, next up, Sigma 50mm 1.4. Uh, this lens is optically fantastic. You know, checks all the boxes. It's a 50, it's a prime, it's great. Um, me, personally, I think this was a waste of money and I'm almost definitely going to actually sell it. I've probably taken less than a thousand pictures on it. Um, it just never really works for me. Uh, for me, if I'm gonna go prime in that somewhere between 24 and 50 millimeter range, the 35 to me checks all the boxes, right? Whereas the 50 I feel like starts being a little too restrictive. Um, I, whereas I would rather kind of just zoom with my feet and use the 35. Uh, because at a certain point I can only back up so far with the 50 and still get everything in. So it is a great lens. It is a great 50. Uh, just, you know, it's, it's, it's not you, it's me. Um, so we're going to put this on the need to get rid of it pile. Um, so if anyone wants it, check it out. Um, I would show you some recent examples of pictures I've taken with it, but I probably haven't taken a picture with it in over a year. Um, so this is a 50 mil. That's what it is. Okay, 24 to 120. This is the only kit lens that I still ha that I still actually own that's in my setup. Uh, this guy I got with my Nikon D750 way, way, way back in the day. Um, it is a okay photo lens. Uh, it's not variable aperture, but it is f4, so that obviously has its drawbacks. Um, 
I said before, but maybe I'll just say it again, uh, I don't think I've ever taken a professional photo with this lens. Uh, maybe in extraordinarily rare situations. Uh, what this lens does for me and why I haven't just immediately just Craigslisted it is it does serve as a decent travel lens if I'm just doing my own thing. Uh, more and more that's not the case, but I got it, it worked. The reason I own it is for my video setup and what I would when I was doing video all the time with Nikon, I was definitely using this guy all the time. Uh, and especially on Nikon back then, the autofocus was non-existent, so you had to shoot at least f4 anyway. Um, so that wasn't really a drawback. Uh, but yeah, this one also gonna go in the scrap heap, gonna get rid of it. Uh, if someone wants to buy it, cool, it's great. So this is a lens that anyone that wants to do headshots has to buy, all right? If you wanna make money doing headshots, this is a primo investment that you should do sooner rather than later. This is the Nikon 85 1.8. Um, I've used other 85s, and while I can't necessarily say this is the best one, I can say this is the best budget option that no one is gonna notice the difference on. There's no reason to spend more. Um, I'm gonna guess right now that this costs 400 or $500. I could be wrong. Um, but whatever it is, it's cheaper than the 1.4 alternative by Nikon, and it's cheaper than the 1.4 alternative from Sigma. Uh, those lenses may be technically better, but they are very expensive for what they offer. This is a very unique tool. You don't go around shooting exercise with this. This is for headshots. I have this lens in my bag to shoot headshots. I do basically nothing else with it. Um, that said, when you take headshots, they are better if you use an 85. There's a reason it's called a portrait lens. This lens rocks. Um, you also, people would, the, the initial thought is, well, of course buy 1.4, 1.4 is better than 1.8. When you're doing lit headshots, you very rarely are shooting wide open. You're, you know, probably setting around 5.6 to f8, so doesn't matter that this is a 1.8. Uh, what I've also been told, I've not experienced it myself, is that when you do buy Nikon's 1.4, the focus system is actually slower on it. Um, which would make sense, but generally you spend more money, you don't want something that's slower. Uh, this lens feels pretty cheap, you know, it's plasticky, doesn't feel great, but I don't really care if it works. And it works, it does its job, it's a headshot lens. You know, just last weekend I was traveling on a job, we bundled in some extra headshots into it. This lens came with me. I certainly could have used a 24 to 70 for the headshots. I could have used a 70 to 200 for the headshots. This though, is just kind of built for that job. So I use this, it's gonna stay with me forever, even if I only use it here and there. It just does that job really, really, really well, and it's paid for itself over and over and over. Okay, back to weird lenses. This is my uh, Nikon 60 2.8 macro. This is the only macro I own, probably the only macro I will ever own. Um, this lens exists for one purpose in my setup, to take pictures of bride's wedding rings. It's no secret, most photographers have a little side action. Every now and then I'll do some engagement photos, every now and then maybe I'll even pick up a wedding. This is not a sports photography lens. There is, I can't think of a single reason. Maybe you're shooting a medal or something like that. Why you would have this, I've never taken this to a sports photography job, but in the side job, you know, you're gonna do a wedding, you're gonna help some guy out on a second shoot, you're gonna do a proposal or something. This is a lens that takes pictures of wedding rings. That's what you do with this lens. Uh, it's great, there's the, you know, I think there's a 105 macro. It's way more expensive. This was cheap, I bought it used. It does its one job perfectly. Um, yeah, there's really not that much to say about a macro. It is not a sports photography lens. This is a gimmick lens. It does one thing, it does it really well. Don't use it for anything else. It will stay in my closet 330 days a year. No, that's a lie. 360 days a year, right. 360 days a year. Uh, but then those five days that I do use it, 
it's indispensable. Yeah, so thanks for checking out this stuff. If you have questions on why I'm using what I'm using, please drop them below. Like, subscribe, do all those things. Uh, if you want to buy anything, follow those links in the bio. It makes a huge difference. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Cool. Try to catch me howling at the moon